Well, let's do it. Shall we do another? Yeah. Great. This is Out of the Dark, an audio series about Dark Hall, a theater built in 1928 in Regina, Saskatchewan. In this series, we will explore Dark Hall by hearing stories of people who have been touched by this historic performance space. I am your host, Paul Deshane. Episode 5, Formative Experiences. Just off the balcony on the second floor of the restored Dark Hall, there will be a public lounge. You'll be able to mingle there before shows and during intermissions. It's even big enough to host events of its own. But before the restoration, this space filled other purposes over the years. Most famously, the room with the tall windows that looked out from above the dark hall entryway was the office of violinist, conductor, and music teacher, Howard Layton Brown. He was also, from 1955 to 1987, director of Regina's Conservatory of Music. When he passed away at the age of 99 in 2017, Lieutenant Governor Vaughn Solomon Schofield, a close personal friend of Brown's, remarked that he was a gifted musician for his entire life and touched many students with his knowledge and expertise. Though many remember him for his role at the conservatory, his fame in Regina extended all the way back to the war years. He was a decorated bomber pilot who became a flight instructor in Estevan, but he made a name for himself with his recitals in Regina, as attested to in this Leader Post article on January 18, 1943. It was titled, Violinist is Popular, and it goes. Dark Hall was packed to capacity and scores of Reginans were unable to gain admittance Sunday night when the Brass Reed Band of No. 2 Initial Training School RCAF presented another in a series of recitals. A feature is the appearance of Flight Lieutenant Howard Leighton Brown, RAF Station, Estevan. Flight Lieutenant Leighton Brown's clean-cut violin solos proved so popular that he was asked to play three numbers not listed on the program. His accompanist was Mrs. W.J. Mars. Flight Lieutenant Leighton Brown gave his first recital in Melbourne, Australia at the age of 11 and won a university scholarship at 12. He was a protege of Fritz Chrysler and Sir Adrian Bolt. Marches, novelties, and numbers written by Noel Coward, Rachmaninoff, and Romberg were included in the band's program. A highlight was the rendition of Headlines, a modern rhapsody picturing the violent pace of modern life. The band was under the direction of Sergeant Major Deadman. Proceeds will go to the band fund. Hena Elich took violin lessons from Howard Layton Brown for just a few years, and as she'll explain, she's maybe not as fine a student, but the experience had a profound impact on her life. And incidentally, just before we spoke, she sent me some photos of herself standing on the front steps of Dark Hall with Howard Layton Brown that were taken on the day of her very first lesson. Uh, Did you get those pictures that I sent you? I did. They're awesome. (laughs) They are so (laughs) cute. Like, I cannot stand how adorable I am in those pictures. Like... It's like looking fondly on a, like, the kitten version of your cat. Like, it it truly is like, she's a whole other self, like, that I have known separately from who I am now. And, like, Dr. Brown looks phenomenal in that picture. He was 84 when I started taking lessons from him. You were 14 in those pics? Yeah. Oh, it was 2001, 20 years ago. I was staggered to find out that Dr. Brown, like, was so... So old. So old. Yeah. Did he was born in 1924? Yeah. In Australia. Did he did he still have the accent or was it gone mm-hmm. by then? Yeah. Gone? I I started emulating it every every lesson. <laughs> in his office, he had these little uh vials of sand from different parts of the coast in Australia. He told me a lot about his <laughs> life. The, not a lot of which I remember, but just the war. I, I don't remember that, but he would have been like, and then I think he was in Europe and he did some training in Europe and then somehow made his way here. Um, yeah. And then he was like the former first chair of the 
Regina Symphony Orchestra, which is a very big deal to me. I thought it was so cool, like just so cool because I had seen the Regina Symphony Orchestra and I knew who the first chair was. He was this amazing old, like at the time, like this amazing, like old weathered looking man, essentially like Dr. Brown, but more eccentric because he played with such flourish. And um, I could imagine the relationship that that man and Victor Sawa had. And it was like, it was so precious. It was so precious. And he got to be your teacher. And no, I got to have him as my teacher. He didn't get to be my teacher. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why he took me on. <laughs> I honestly don't. I have, I don't, I don't understand. I don't. And I should ask my mom about this. I don't know what the process was that she went through to find him because my teacher, my former teacher, when he was in like, I don't know, like his first year of college or something at the point where he was like, I can't teach you anymore. But he wouldn't have known anybody in Regina. Like we lived south of Swift Current. And so we were quite separate, quite rural. And so thinking about how my mom went about finding him, and I'm sure, I'm sure she just called the conservatory. But yeah. It's not like there weren't other less prestigious violin teachers. Like there were, there had to have been many. And I don't, there was just no option in Swift Current. And so their answer was, you know, to go to Regina. And so somehow they found Dr. Brown. Can you tell me about that first day? Yeah. I, if it was now, I would have been riddled with anxiety, like anticipatory anxiety. I don't remember that from the day, but I can't imagine that the three hour trip from our small rural town to Regina was not, you know, fraught filled. So we, the whole family traveled to Regina, mostly because it was just a trip to Regina. Right. And (laughs) we pulled up to this very old monastic looking building, stone masoned building and I had never been in a building like that before and it felt very I don't know like I was participating in something very old and established like like um like the Royal Conservatory in Toronto or Juilliard or whatever I was aware of all of these things and I was like the history of music is within these walls, you know? And so we, we pulled up and I got out. I think my mom did, my mom did come to that first lesson. She came to that first lesson and thank God, because I I'm positive. I made eyes to her like the whole time, because I was like, what is happening? Like the whole time I just was like, I don't know what to do. And Dr. Brown was very, he had a lot of really high level students. Like one of his, one of his students was currently in the RSO and she had students and it was very high level. And it was pretty clear. I'm sure pretty early on that I wasn't going to be one of those students, but he just kind of went with it. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand how someone with that level of prestige is just like, it's fine. This student is just kind of a waste of my time, but like, why not? Like, why not bring her along, pat her on the back? He wanted me to practice like two hours a day because that was pretty standard. And (laughs) there was simply no way that I would be practicing two hours a day. I didn't know how to play that long. I didn't have that much to play. He was like, well, it's going to be what it's going to be. And it's up to you, which is genuinely now as a music teacher, how I teach, because I recognize that a lot of the students that come to me have very busy, intense, extracurricular filled lives that I can't take away from them. And so how they learn music under me is going to largely be up to them, but I will be there to work with what they have. And I didn't realize until the last time that we were talking about this, that 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 might've been why or how I came to this. But when, when I was taking from him, I did participate in like a provincial competition and I was unmatched in my low level of, (laughs) you know, skill, but I was a good technical player. I had really good intonation, you know, I don't know, whatever. 
No, no, no. My, my life as a violinist is like confusing to me because it was very intense and also very short lived. And so I'm like, why did that even happen? My life as a, as a pianist is, has been lifelong. Like when people ask me how long I've been playing, I was like, how old am I? 30 years. That's how long I've been playing. So, you know, it's odd and confusing and it's not something I can pick up again because it's, it was too short lived to, to live in my body. But Dr. Brown was there and present and very much willing to be a part of the short lived thing that it was. You have talked a few times, though, about your love of music. Yeah. 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 yeah so yeah, do yeah. you think that's where he that's that he wasn't responding to your your dedication to the violin craft, but to your affection for the violin as an instrument and the noises it can make? The noises it can make. <laughs> I, I love musicianship. I, I love the technical skill that goes into playing music. My best friend growing up, um, and still is my best friend to this day. We, we went through our piano lives together. We were always at the same level. We were always taking the same exams often on the same day. And, um, my mom, there would be these concert series in Swift Current and my mom made an effort to take us to those. And so Carly would come with me and Carly would often fall asleep. (laughs) It was very, I don't know. She lived on a cattle ranch and she had been up early. I don't know. But I was like, I love watching people play instruments. I want to watch hands on a piano, hands on a violin fingerboard. I like it's It is such a a divine pleasure to watch people make music, specifically people with a very high level of skill, not me. (laughs) It is possible that that's what he was relating to. I, I was a very charismatic youth and I was genuinely very interested in him as a person. And so it was, it was very easy. Our lessons were very easy for us to you know spend that time together. And they were an hour as a 14 year old, you don't, have an hour long lesson. And so it was the fact that those weren't arduous. Oh my gosh. I just remember this. When I was taking from him, I asked one of my teachers if I could play. This is so funny. I'm so excited to tell you this. I asked one of my teachers if I could play the last post at the Remembrance Day service at our school on the violin. Yeah, I know. And so my teacher was like, I guess so. Cause he had never heard me play before. He did not know how he did not know my level of proficiency. And so I went to Dr. Brown in my lesson and I was like, I am going to play the last post at my school's remembrance day service. Can you um, score it for me? And not a difficult piece of music to score. It's like, it moves in thirds. So he did. And he was like, he was again, again, this man, he was so open to this. It is not normal or even maybe appropriate to have the last post played on an instrument other than a horn. But he was like, okay. So I played the last post and the reverie, which is the following after the the minute of silence. And it was like, it was really good. Like I, I did a good job. And he was like, it's like, he just kind of leaned into who I was as a person and then made it. And this is a, a lot of how I do my job as a, as a child and youth, I do like school aged programming with the military and I focus so much less on the program than I do on the child, a child first care model of care. And it was like, he unintentionally was employing that model of care with me as his student, where he just, you know, I wasn't going to be in the symphony. I wasn't going to be a award-winning violinist, but he was there. He was in my life. He was being paid to be in my life and in my life he was. And I always felt so much care from him. Like at the very last recital, like he gave me a hug and he told me that he was really disappointed that I was going to stop because I had progressed, you know, to the point where he thought it was kind of sad that I was stopping, but he fully supported and understood. And it was like, as a person who doesn't have a lot of like extended family. I'm like, this man was a great example of the power of, you know, close friend relationships and of different generations. 
You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR, tuned into the community. Were these recitals in Dark Hall as well? They were in the conservatory. I never got okay. to play in the in the auditorium at Dark Hall. It was always kind of this, the entrance to the auditorium was, I might have opened the door once to look into it, but it just looked so old. Like the rows were very close together. The seats were very hard and, but it was dark. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't yeah. really see the auditorium. So the recitals, I only ever did like two year end recitals in the conservatory. And he also had like, he had quite a range of students. So he had like young children playing their little early Mozart and uh, they were better than I was. <laughs> oh no. Um, like, no, but only because they were in a lower level, but like their comfort and knowledge of, they were so, so proficient. So you were in the practice rooms in the basement, I think they were, when you did your lessons? No, we were in his studio. Where was the studio? On the second floor. Did it have the big windows? Mm -hmm. It looked like some sort of modern era architectural, like it had wonderful, wonderful olive green carpet. And he had these chairs that were like, he had so many chairs in that room. I don't understand why he had so many chairs. Big windows, big window sills or ledges, I guess. It felt like, oh, you know what it felt like in the crown. <laughs> it felt like in the crown, a, a room in Buckingham Palace, like just a, a, like a side room, like an unimportant room, but just very stately and very timeless. And like a lot of a lot of investment had gone into it when it was first staged. And he had like you know, pictures all over the walls. It was a very large room, like, you know, not a not a small studio. Can you just tell me a little bit more, just more recollections of what it was like to go up those stairs and go into his office? The very, the first time I mentioned, I mentioned last time that we had, I was taking this very seriously. I didn't really understand the ramifications of taking from someone with such prestige, but I was, I was ready for it. And there was this understanding in my rural town that I, I had a level of artistic skill that needed to be employed elsewhere, which was not true. <laughs> My small town was extraordinarily oriented toward athletics. Okay. We were athletes. I was So someone with my level of artistic range, musical range was kind of like a unicorn. Like I was the unicorn of the, and I, you know, I, I have studied voice. I have a good singing voice. I was, I played piano. I played violin. I was a good actor. Like I was in the drama, all of these things. And people were like, you're going to be on Broadway. And I'm just like, this is, this is the misunderstanding that we have as people from such a small context. And so I was ready on that day to take my skills out word. And so when we got there, it was, it was a cool building. Like it was cold in the building. And I went up the stairs, which again, seemed very monastic, like very, like I could have been doing a chant going up them. Um, but I heard, I would hear like voices and instruments coming from other practice rooms. And then I got outside his office where he had a bench and I would wait there. And then he would welcome me and the, either the other student would leave or he would have just gotten there. And I would go in and we would have a conversation. And, and so it was very, very stately, but also very hallowed, I could say. I think that's what I, what I mean when I say that it felt very monastic because the stone makes everything feel very serious and the quality of sound or the quality of musicianship happening within the, the room surrounding the hallway that I was in just felt very important and very laden with history and future and you know I, I think last time you talked about how there wasn't a lot of like stone construction there was a couple of like a couple of cathedrals in the small um or I guess in the larger uh catholic towns there's a uh 
small town south of where I grew up called Pontex, and they had a fairly nice cathedral. And then Gravelberg's cathedral is quite significant. I spent very little time in those, but also those were all, those were both limestone, right? They were, they yeah. were a different, a different sort of stately. Um, Dark Hall is these, I don't know, massive throws of granite that the, the, the darkness of it feels different. Did you think coming to coming to Regina to take your, your musical career to the next level? <laughs> like did, did it, did it seem natural that you would go from a small town to this like church, like this monastic stone building? Like, is that like how, cause you referred to it last time as main character energy. My, main character energy. So I said last time that when we were talking that yeah. I imagined, <laughs> I, I'm sure, I'm sure that shortly before that, uh, and I, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up right now, but shortly before that I had seen the Truman show be, which came out. I'm pretty sure. Oh, in 98. Yeah. So I had seen it a few times. So um, the Truman show was just such an, interesting examination of one individual's life and understanding of that life because Truman doesn't know he's being watched but what if we knew that we were being watched right like how would we live if we knew we were being watched and I always had that like that little thing in my brain was like you should live like you're being watched which is a terrible terrible philosophy <laughs> lord like that's it's not healthy it's not healthy because you're not being watched and and it puts the amount of importance on anything you do way out of proportion yeah so but this this notion that i was doing this unbelievable thing getting out of getting out of my car getting my rented violin also, I was using up until this point, a three quarter size violin. So, you know, you have the small ones when you're little yeah. and then when you hit puberty slash the end of your growth cycle, um, you get a full size violin. That's the violin, generally the violin that you use for the rest of your life. And uh, I had been given a violin when I was seven, I want to say, and it was a three quarter size and that's what I had been using. And so he brought to my first lesson, a violin that I was going to rent from the conservatory. And so I brought my three quarter. So in one of the pictures, there's, um, I'm holding the rented violin that he had brought and my violin is in the background on like the stone stairs. And he, he brought that. So I, I got to, you know, dark hall, got my rented violin and I walked up the steps by myself, like not the first time, but like onward going. And I always, and I think I mentioned last time that I, I, I used to put a lot of thought into what I wore to these. And this was pre days of like makeup. And so I wasn't, I wasn't wearing makeup, but I wanted to make sure that I looked together. Then I looked very like clean, like, you know, as professional as a 14 year old can be. And so in, in the pictures for my first lesson, I was wearing like khaki pants. And these like hilarious black foam slides that I am sure I got at Walmart for $7 and they had like beading around, <laughs> around the strap. Oh man, they're a like beautiful picture into, you know, 2001. I had a zigzag part and I wore this, this sweater that was a man sweater. There was a time in the very early 2000s where girls would buy men's sweaters from bootlegger in their size. And it was like a, it was a pretty good look. Like it was a pretty good look. And you could, you could kind of like really massage the appropriateness of that sweater from like, <laughs> from like, like California surfer to like, I'm going to go to my violin lesson and at a very cool conservatory type place. So I always wanted to look like I was put together. And, and so that, that kind of feeds into the main character energy too, where I was a very, I was very concerned and very not preoccupied with it, but I was, I was very attentive to the potential for outward perception. And I don't think that, I don't think that it was unappreciated. I do think that, that Dr. Brown was definitely of the generation that would have appreciated, like it wouldn't have been okay for me to come in athleisure wear, but the, the importance that I put on it was probably not as 
high is, I believe. <laughs> he really seemed to appreciate the photo. Right? Here's what here's what happened in that in that moment. Uh, yeah. He was the sweetest man. So we were outside and my mom wanted to take pictures. And also those pictures were on film, like probably on my dad's nice camera. My dad had a really nice, like the camera that you had before you had a DSLR camera. Like it was a nice camera. He really liked photography and um, they wanted to take a picture of me. And as they were taking the picture of me, Dr. Brown opened the door behind me because oftentimes he, I was on a Saturday, he wouldn't have had any other lessons. And so he would come for my lesson and then leave. And so he came out and he was like, Oh, you're taking a picture. Let's take a picture together. It was his idea. (laughs) He's so cute in that picture. His face is so happy. And he's like, I don't know. I don't even know what to do. And I, I tried to read the book like that he is was carrying. Like it looks to be like a John Lacar kind of, or Lacare, how do you pronounce his like kind of English spy novel? But it's like he is exactly the spirit that he gave off in that picture is exactly who he is and exactly who he was. So you did those lessons for was it two years? It might have been three, but okay. I don't actually know. Um, the The hard thing is that those date the dates aren't on those pictures. So did I start in the eighth grade or in the ninth grade? I don't actually know. Two or three years. Um, I know that I stopped at the end of my tenth grade. So it might have been two or three. Anyway. Right. Um, but really, a really formative time for me, right? a really formative time for me to be engaging in something that prestigious. I use that word so much, but I don't know how else to really fully encapsulate how the, 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 the level to which I was out of my depth. I, again, due to him, I still got to go on the whole ride. I got to go on the whole ride, even though I was putting in minimal effort. <laughs> I did all the things he wanted me to do. He just really adjusted his On the front page of the entertainment section of the August 14th, 1980 Regina Leader Post, there's an article about the Children's Summer Theater by Denise Ball. She describes how the program takes kids aged 8 to 13 through the process of putting on a musical. In this case, the show was A Whale of a Tale. In the article, Ball says the person tying the whole program together is musical director Ken Roberts, a former Regina resident. She relates his biography like this. A native of Wales, Roberts came to Canada in 1966 and taught in Oxbow. After moving to Regina, he taught music at Campbell Collegiate and founded the Guala Singers. Roberts left Regina for Toronto, where he studied and sang with the Canadian Opera Company, before returning to England, where he ran a medieval manor house which specialized in Jacobean banquets. When the organizers of the Children's Summer Festival heard Roberts would be paying a visit to Regina this summer for a Guala Singers reunion, they asked him to contribute his experience as both a teacher and performer to the children's program. Accompanying this article is a photo of camp choreographer Donna Bobick working with camp participants Natasha Woods, Veronica Gusway, and a very young Don Bergstrom. Dawn is now the manager and curator of Dark Hall, and she shared with me her recollections of the Children's Summer Theatre program. I'm Dawn Bergstrom. Uh, My title is Dark Hall Manager and Curator. You are working, like, on Dark Hall now. Like, you're involved with Dark Hall in a professional capacity. But you used to, as a child, have a uh, connection to Dark Hall as well. Yes, uh, I used to attend in the summers there used to be a children's musical theater camp and I did that for three years and we would go to Dark Hall we would spend a couple weeks there and we would do everything we would 
we would be the people in the show, but we would also learn how to build the set and we would help with painting, of course, adult supervising, but we would help and build all that and you get to learn everything. And I did that from the time I was seven, seven, eight and nine. I was right. there and it was always the highlight of my summer. I loved doing that. Can I ask what years those were? Oh, that would have been 1980 through 82. Uh, when you were that young, what was your impression of Dark Hall? It was it was a beautiful space, but it was also an adventurous space. There were so many nooks and crannies and places to explore. There was still the tunnel then, so that link to the college building. Um, it was it was a big adventure for a kid. It always seemed like every room you went into was a new surprise. And, that, and oh, we loved exploring it. We ate our lunches on the front steps and and, you know, we would have music rehearsals up in the room off of the balcony. And oh, it was just it was it was such an adventure to be there. The room off the balcony that used to be the office up there. What was that like? I always it, it seemed so. Uh, big when I was a kid, but it really wasn't. <laughs> you think of that. I remember there all the windows and lots of light, and uh, yeah, it was always the a special room to get to go up to because uh, every you, everything else we did was on kind of the main floor and in the basement. But if you got to go up and and practice music in the upper room, it was such a treat because it was beautiful. It felt like a tower going up there. Now, did you guys kind of get the free run of the place or? Uh, we had the whole place, certainly, but there was a lot of adults around to keep us uh, keep us in control. Uh, yeah. But it did feel very much like it was our space. Uh, the, the adults really let us take ownership of it. And, that, and the age range for the kids in the camp was from, well, from eight to 12. I got special permission to start when I was younger. And the older kids, even though 12 is not that old, the older kids too also kind of set the guidelines for us younger ones about what we were able to do. And that's uh, because people would go every year and that. So there was, they kind of were in the ones who set boundaries a little more even than the adults. The camps that you did, how were they structured? Like, what, what would you be doing over the course? I think it was, like, would it have been a week? Uh, it was a couple weeks, actually. Oh, wow. The first couple days would be the auditions so that you could get cast in whatever role that you were going to be playing. Um, back then, I was a dancer first. So uh, my dance teacher was the choreographer. So I was always uh, one of the featured dancers. I love music too. So I got to sing as well. And so you would kind of find out where your, what your role was. And uh, then you would spend the day rehearsing. You would be, we'd be there all day from, I feel like it was from about 9am to about three. And we had our lunches right there as well. And you just, it was a rotation. You were in a group, you, you know, for an hour you'd be in dance and then for an hour you'd be in music and then staging. And then you'd go and help build the set and you'd paint something. So you always had uh, a different experience. You had to go around and try different things every day. We did that Monday to Friday. And then at the end of the camp, the last couple of days were the performances. They were always afternoon performances. And I remember they were sold out all the time. We yeah. packed that place. Yeah. Were these performances open to the public or were these just the families? No, they were open to the public, actually. I, there was always a uh, a contest to who could sell the most tickets, which I won a couple times. Really? And, yeah, and we would sell our tickets. And and yeah, I mean, of course, it was mainly friends and family. But, but yes, it was absolutely open. The performances that you were putting on, were these plays that had been purchased by the conservatory for you guys to learn? Or did you guys come up with your own performance? Or how did that work? Um, the gentleman who was kind of the music director and director, Ken Roberts, uh, it was originally from England and had a, a history of doing pantos. And so what he did is, uh, is he kind of took some scripts that he had and adapted them for kids uh, because often they the pantos are done by adults for a child audience, but he actually took it and made it child performers for a child audience so um he the i remember the first one we did was based on jonah and the whale 
okay. uh, called A Whale of a Tale. We did Aladdin. Uh, we did The Bells of Bruges, which I don't even know where he found that. But yeah, he would take existing stories and scripts that he had and he'd adapt them and he'd insert songs and that had familiar melodies, but he would adapt the, the lyrics for the show. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was a great adventure. What was your favorite of the camps? Actually, Aladdin was the most fun. Do you remember what you played? Uh, I was a harem dancer. And that sounds <laughs> terrible when you say that, that you're, as an eight-year-old, you were a harem dancer. But yeah, that's what it was, yes. Why was that one particularly fun? I think because it was so fantastical too like that you know the story of Aladdin is such a fun story as well I think I connected with that story more than the other two um mm-hmm. I remember the dances were so fun the costumes were great um we just yeah it, it was it was just uh the story and the things we got, I got to do in it were a lot of fun now did you guys make your own costumes or were those did did your parents get roped into that the, they always had a couple parents who kind of oversaw. They had, you know, mothers and, and fathers too who uh, liked to sew. They would just, they would volunteer their time for a couple of weeks. They'd also source things, but a lot of it, it was made. Uh, my first year, I remember it was very much um, our own clothes with a couple key pieces. With Aladdin, they made everything. The camps were pretty hardcore back in the 80s, hey? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They were intense. I mean, we didn't think of it as intense, but we loved it. But yeah, it was very involved. I look back at it now and think of everything that they did, the people they brought in. Um, I look back at some programs and realized that, you know, like the set designer is a professional set designer in Saskatoon that I worked with later in life as a professional actor. You know, the people they brought in and yeah, it, they, uh, they went all out for it. I'm, I'm sad that it didn't last longer than it did, actually, is that it only, it has gone a couple years before me but I was it ended when I in 82. You did these camps and you were doing dance as well uh were you involved in like other theater and performances and stuff like that as a kid? I did a couple of different things. I, I mean, I danced with both uh, Boyan School of Dance and then Rittenberg School of Dance. And we had some of our dance recitals at Dark Hall. So mm-hmm. I have photos of me in costume in those dressing rooms that oh, I can wow. go into now and go, I know this dressing room. Um, I was also part of the uh, Conservatory Children's Choir as well for many years. So that we also would sing in there. And then as I got a little older, I did things like Lyric Light Opera, which is now Lyric Musical Theatre. So I've had opportunities on that stage throughout and that's in, yeah, all through my childhood. I was doing music and dance and acting, whatever I could do. A question that I've been asking a lot of people is why do you think it is so important to have a vital culture of performance in a city? Well, live performance is a different experience. It's so immediate, you know, and it's never the same. You know that like when you were in a, an audience watching a play, Yes, they do the same lines every night, but the reactions of the audience always inform a performer's what they're doing on stage as well. So it's always slightly different. So when you go to see something, you know, you're seeing a unique piece of work. Whereas when you watch it on TV, any day you watch it, it's going to be exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's that's really important is that immediate and in that and we share reactions, whether you're on stage or you're in the audience, you're sharing that experience at home or in a movie theater or something like that. You don't have that same connection with the person beside you so many times, like a comedy or something like that. When you hear somebody else laugh. So at what they see, sometimes that makes you laugh. You don't get that kind of thing. So it's such a community experience being in live performance, uh, whether it's laughter or crying or even just sharing that is very different than, than anything you can watch on your screen. Why do you think Regina needs a performance space like Dark Hall? And Well, from a purely logistical point of view, there are not a lot of venues of this size here. Um, We have smaller venues and we have bigger venues and that, and there are a lot of groups that uh, it's, it's just not, there's just not a place right now. 
it's a community space. It has always been, as a community, I think we've always felt very deeply connected to Dark Hall in a way that we don't as much to something like the, the Connexus Art Center. I find for myself growing up, the Connexus was always where you go to see the big shows that come in, and which yeah. was so exciting. And I loved that. Whereas Dark Hall was the place where I could go and perform. And I think that that's it. We take that ownership of it. I think that's why Dark Hall in particular is so important is there are so many performers, both professional and community who have grown up on that stage and to have a place where we can do that. We can grow up. We can be a child on that stage. We can be an adult on that stage is so important for this community. We need that. When you were a kid, the sort of heritage attributes of it, the sort of like the architecture, is that something that you appreciated from a young age? Yeah, it was because it was such a different kind of space. I mean, the the stained glass windows, um, I remember always loving those. I mean, the colors and that... um, there was something, you know, the red curtain always on stage. It it felt different than than other performance spaces. So yeah, it's and like I said, even the the adventures of finding different little rooms and that that other places don't have. Yeah, it was very unique. It felt special. Like it feels you feel like you're getting an opportunity that that is different than than just you know in your dance class or in your school and that that you feel like it's an opportunity that others don't get when you get on that stage you feel like you are getting a special treat it's a gift to be on that stage even when I was a little kid it was always so exciting when you got to go to dark hall and do even for a dance recital when you move that that's that ultimate that you get to be on that stage and be there and doing a show there or whatever it's there yeah it just has a very special feeling to it it's because although it does seat at that time it set almost 600 people and never felt big. It was always such an intimate space. And, and it feels like you're walking into history. You know that there's all these people who have performed there before you. And it, you just, it's, you know, it's a special gift to get to be on that stage. What about the tunnels? Um. I mean, those were just kind of, we would just run between the, the buildings and that, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, that's a, a, a fun little thing just to be able to run through and end up in the building next door. Yeah. And of course they don't exist anymore, but. Yeah. Were <laughs> uh, you sad when they had to get rid of those? Yeah, it, it was funny when I, when I took this job, so many people actually wrote me and one of their their first questions they asked were, are the tunnels still there? So <laughs> my first day I had to go and find out if they still had them. And of course they had closed them up years ago, but, yeah. but uh, yes, everybody, it's funny that so many people, that's what they actually remember is those tunnels because that was such a different thing that you felt like you were finding a secret, even though so many people knew about it. It felt though like you were part of a secret. Um, do you uh, do you still have contact with any of the kids that you would have done performances at Dark Hall? Um, there's a few. Uh, I mean, some of us went to school together, and and yeah, and our paths continue to cross. The nice thing about social media these days is that I think we're more in contact with people through that than maybe we used to be. So yeah, I do have yeah. a few people, and certainly I have friends who, like I said, when I when I told them that I was coming to do this, they had their own stories as well about growing up and performing on that stage so there's lots of us who have very fond memories of being there you're listening to out of the dark a series about regina's historic performance space dark hall on 91.3 fm cjtr tuned into the community you've had a a career that has a connection to, um, well, to Dark Hall specifically, but but could you explain how, like, these experiences as a performer, as a young person and up through your life, um, what they've meant to you as a person? You know, doing those summer camps at Dark Hall really set me on the path for my life. Um, I, 
I was a child who my parents uh, were wonderful and allowed me to explore all my interests. And I started as, like I said, as a dancer, but I loved music and acting. And this was kind of my first experience with acting, really. And I mean, I went on to have a career as a, an actor and singer and dancer and that's now moving into admin and uh, theater that kind of started my love of theater and that has shaped my entire life. Um, so my career and uh, my partner and every, my friends, so many, like my dearest friends are within the performing arts community. So getting set on this road many years ago as a seven-year-old just that's set the path for my life. So it be shaped who I am. Uh, you, so you, you had like this childhood experience with Dark Hall. You've play, performed there a bunch throughout your life. And then, you know, here you are as like, as a, as a grown up with a career where you've got this connection back to Dark Hall. W when you were taking this job, how did that feel? It was exciting. It was, it felt like it was meant to be that this was just waiting for me. Um, I was, I lived in BC the last few years. I was away and, and a friend sent me the job posting and said, I saw this and immediately thought of you. And I immediately was just, yes, this is, this is where I'm meant to be. It's, it's full circle for me to come back, um, to be a part of bringing Dark Hall back to the community. I, I couldn't miss that. It's, you know, even sharing the, the news with my family who are not as much in the arts as I am. Both my brothers were like, well, of course you're going back to Dark Hall. That, that was your childhood. That's where you're meant to be. So the, for the, everybody, it seemed like it just, it made sense. And I know how important this venue is to the community because it's, it's that important to me too. And, and this arts community has always been so important to me. I know how hard everyone works to have these opportunities and to have the chance to be able to make it a little easier for people would be amazing. What is your dream? for dark hall yeah you know for the next like 10 hundred years kind yeah. of thing uh, that that it becomes a vibrant hub for the performance community again and not that there's opportunities for for groups within the community to use it themselves that we bring in artists from across the country and the world and to perform on that stage. So we can also get a chance to see people that, and artists that we haven't had a chance to over the years. I see it as a shared venue. I, I don't think it's just bringing in people and I don't think it's just the community. I think there is so much for us all to learn from each other. And I think that's it. I want to see it, uh, there being something there every weekend. I think it's, and that it's it's everything. It's theater, it's music, it's dance, it's public speaking, it's lectures, it's performance art, it's you know, poetry, everything. I think that's that's what it can be so much to so many people. I want to see kids groups in there and youth and adults, all ages, you know, everything that it was in the past and better. You have a long history with Old Dark Hall, and now you've like worked with it through the transformation. How would you describe that transformation to somebody who's listening to it on the radio? <laughs> it's, it will surprise you, but it will also take you back. I love that there are new improvements that are going to make it technically more accessible for everyone. Um, that there's the capabilities of that space are bigger than they've ever been, but that we've also, they've also kept those features that we all remember so fondly, the doorways, the, the stained glass window, um, even the colors within the auditorium, while the seats are new and more comfortable, there's still that red 
I always think of the red color when I think of Dark Hall. Um, you go down to the dressing rooms and there's still on the bricks, on the walls, people's signatures who've done shows there. Those haven't been covered up. So you have that nod to history, but you also know that there's brand new lights and sound equipment as well that will allow shows to, to do things they weren't able to do before. Um, I think that's, that's the thing. It's going to feel like coming home, but in the best possible way. Is there a feature for the re restored dark hall that you are particularly like a fan of? Walking into the auditorium itself is a very special experience. There used to be uh, the stenciling around the windows and all the features that was painted over for a long time. And now they've restored that and, and upgraded that. So having that touch um, when you first walk into the auditorium, the fact that it's a triple door now, this, the middle door was hidden for, for as long as I remember to have that. Um, it's that experience when you walk into that auditorium. That is my favorite still and that to see. There's still so much to look around and see. And the fact that we can use the balcony again for many years, it was shut down. And uh, to be able to go up to that balcony again and sit there, you yeah, know, it's, it's pretty special. They put a lot of thought and consideration into this. They've done the necessary upgrades to make this a sustainable theater going forward. And that while, you know, still remaining true to the heart of the building. One of the things that was interesting when the university put together their video series talking about the renovation, when I when I was interviewing for this job and looked at, I watched those videos and and at the end of one of them, they they scan through a bunch of programs and clippings and that, and there's a seven year old me on the front page of the Leader Post in really? in a whale of a tail, and and it just brought me back to have. Uh, to see myself there <laughs> as a child. It, it kind of seemed like a sign that this was meant to be, that I was already there in the work that was happening. My thanks to Hannah Elich and Don Bergstrom for sharing their memories of their time in Dark Hall. You've been listening to Out of the Dark, an exploration of Dark Hall through stories. This series was made possible thanks to the generous support of Sask Arts and the University of Regina Conservatory of Performing Arts. Dark Hall is situated in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Mady Maitchif Nation. Music for Out of the Dark is from Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, 465, and performed by Christian Robinson and Hang Han Ho on violins, Jonathan Ward on viola, and Simon Fryer on cello. They are Regina Symphony Orchestra performers. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Thank you for listening. <laughs>